So hello everybody, my name is Roxy Monroe and I'm with KidLit TV and we're thrilled to be here at the Texas Library Association Annual Conference in Austin. And I have two really great stars with me, Dan Santat, <laughs> I was mispronouncing his simple name. Um, how do you pronounce it? Santat. There you go. Nothing fancy. <laughs> yeah, doesn't, doesn't, it's Santa with a T. Okay. Extra T. And Rhett Miller. Yes, Rhett Miller. And we have an artist and a musician, although they're both artists and probably both musicians. And you're here to talk about this really cool book, No More Poems by Little Brown. And you wrote it. Yeah, I like how you gave it a question mark. It's, it's, it's got an exclamation mark, so when I say it, I always yell, No More Poems! But I don't think that's right either. I don't know, Dan, do you have a pronunciation for this? Well, you know, it's part of my accent to make everything sound like a question. I'm like, no more poems? How are you doing today? He's kind of a California girl. Yeah. <laughs> it's from the valley. It's very much a valley thing, you know. You have that, what's the, what's the term, uh, the vocal fry? I like to read poems. I don't even know if I'm vocal frying right. No, I'll, I'll give it to you. <laughs> this is the vocal fry. You got to kind of... That's vocal fry. Now, That's vocal now fry. you... Now you're a musician, so you're like really good with sounds, I bet, right? <laughs> and um, I, f I feed my kids with music, so if that's good, I guess, I think, yeah. The audience agrees with you. Well, let me give you a, qu give a quick shout out to our great KidLit TV founder, Julie Gribble, who worked uh, as a sound engineer for NBC on Conan O'Brien. Uh, and do you know that she mixed your music? I saw that. Yeah, we appeared on Conan O'Brien a couple of times, and we were mixed by your founder. It was a long time ago, but um, we recently did it again, and it just wasn't quite as good because you weren't there. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> now try to top that. Uh, well, he feeds his kids with music. I feed my children with fear. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Say, what are you doing? You're way out of line. But here's a bowl of Pop-Tarts because I'm too lazy to cook. No, I'm not. I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. You're too busy drawing. Um, so, so tell me about the synthesis and origin of this book. I mean, you wrote it. Did you guys know each other beforehand? No, we didn't, which, um, which is, I can't believe that we didn't know each other because since we've met, uh, we've figured out that we are basically the same person. Yeah, but living in different places, different parents or whatever. But um, I had written all these poems and I met uh, Megan Tingley at Little Brown, my editor, and they're so great. And then I heard Dan on a podcast and I thought, this guy sounds so cool. And I went and I looked at his art, realized I owned a bunch of books that he'd drawn. My kids loved them. And, um, and, I, and I said to Megan and them at Little Brown, maybe you could ask Dan Santat to do it. And they laughed at me. They said, yeah, good luck getting Dan Santat. He's only the best illustrator in the world. And I said, well, maybe you could ask him. Just and they give it a try. Yeah, and they did. And he was so cool. He said yes. Wow. And so did you look at the manuscript first or just go yes over the phone? I'm here. Oh, yeah, no. I absolutely. I read, I read all the poems. And they just had a wonderful Shel Silverstein kind of feel to them. And I just, it was one of those things I didn't want to pass up. But we did actually, so the thing is like, you know, we, we met through this process of making the book. But indirectly, we actually knew each other in weird ways because a good friend of mine who worked in the animation industry lived across the street from his bassist. And there was a period of time where I actually lived down the street from both of them. And so, uh, you know, Murray, his bassist, uh, had, 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 you know, he was married to someone who was the voice of the main character on a cartoon show that I had on the Disney Channel called The Replacements. And it was just like this weird, this weird connection that we had from like, like 20 years ago or 15 years ago or something like that. And across the uh, United States, because you're on the East Coast and you're on the West Coast. Yeah, Is correct. that correct? I'm in Los Angeles. Yeah. And you're in? I'm in New York, but it's funny how those things don't really matter as much, especially because I'm a musician and I tour all the time. And Dan does a lot of book events and you wind up traveling a lot. And obviously we're meeting now in Texas, which is where I grew up. And and uh, it's pretty fun. I make it out to L.A. a lot. And my bandmates, my like he said, Murray lives in, my bass player lives in Los Angeles. Two guys live in Texas. We never rehearse. We meet up wherever the first show of the tour is and just start our touring. So geography is less of an obstacle than it used to be, I think. 
And also interacting, sending. Uh, did you um, did you send him sketches and that sort of thing, or did you just do write write the basic book and like editors like you to to have the manuscript right. edited and then hand it to the illustrator, right. which I find irritating. But I don't know about you. <laughs> um, I remember submitting sketches, but I don't I don't know if you got to see any of them. You did, like as the process was going. There was at one point where uh, we were just talking about this last night where uh, I drew a bio photo of him in the back and then I think they made room for more poems. Um, you know, I think there was some, there was some light notes about uh, the rock star dad and uh, you, you in particular, you, like you didn't want the, the resemblance of you in the book? I, I don't recall. Look, the, the thing about Dan that I realized from the very first round of, because the way you work, I think, is you send a, like blue line sketches. Yeah. So your very first sketches are what you, I think, would consider really rough. But when I saw them, when I saw them, I thought, okay, that's the book. I thought it was over. I thought we were done. It's, so really, I never, every time they would show me something, and like when, when Dan sends stuff in, they, they try to keep us very separate. And Normal, yeah. I think that's fine because who knows? I could be crazy, and then I go over to your house. I'm like, "Why did you give me earrings in the picture, or whatever?" But um, because the guy that's the rock star dad in the book looks nothing like me, and I was kind of happy that it didn't because I really love the idea that these these in the book these are narrators and they're protagonists, and it's not me, and it's not my kids, and it's not our dog Ziggy. Although there's some versions of them in the poems, and then kind of in the artwork as well. Well, like the you sort of accidentally made the son in the book in that poem Rockstar Dad kind of looks and reads a lot like my son Max. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I just met his family for the first time a couple days ago and I met when I met Max I said wait a sec this is weird because you kind of look like the kid that I drew in the book so it's just all like it's just pure coincidence. Oh that's so cool. Now I want to ask both of you being totally super creative people um, you have written poems, and you're a musician and a writer. I noticed that you've done some fabulous work in some really high-end publications. Did you study English, or what is your background? Well, I, 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 st I did a lot of English in high school. I was the editor of the school literary magazine, and then we founded an underground literary magazine and, uh, and really loved it. Then I got a full scholarship to Sarah Lawrence College for creative writing. I went for one semester... <laughs> and dropped out and gave up my scholarship because I thought, man, I gotta do rock and roll. And now I'm like, if one of my kids did that, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think it worked out. I've Got made away a, with it. Yeah, I made a career out of rock and roll. My idea was that I would do rock and roll while I'm young, and then they kick you out when you turn 30, which thankfully didn't happen. But then I would do, uh, yeah, exactly. And then I would segue into write proper writing, maybe like long form fiction or who knew kids poems uh, when I was in my 40s. Um, like Kurt Vonnegut didn't publish a novel till he was in his 40s. So that was sort of my mental justification for doing this, this dropping out thing, which I think is crazy now in retrospect, but it's all worked out. Say it all worked out. Yeah. Now, what's your background? I know you've done TV, but before that, did you go to art school? Uh, my parents never let me take art classes because they wanted me to grow up and be a doctor. They actually make money. Yeah, you know. You fooled them. Right. Okay. So it wasn't it wasn't until I got to college and all my friends looked at my biology notes and they said, you draw a really good cell. <laughs> and they said, you know, and they knew that I was passionate about art. And so they kind of pushed me in that direction and said, you know, well, why don't you just see if you can get into art school? Let's your just, peers or your parents? Uh, my peers. They just said, let's, just, let's see if you just get into art school. Let's just see if you can. And I remember driving all over San Diego, just trying to find like figure drawing workshops to make some kind of portfolio, never having any formal education other than, you know, copying comic book covers and, and things like that. I applied to like six art schools, got into all of them. Um, and then on my graduation day, like I told my parents, I was interested in going to art school and I could see my dad like getting a little sad about it. And I said, uh, before you interrupt, I think I'm going to tell you that I'm going to do it whether you like it or not. And my dad just kind of looked at me and he said, okay, well, I just want you to be happy. And that was like the biggest, that was like the biggest earth shattering thing. But because of that, it gave me this feeling like, well, now I have this opportunity to, to prove to you that it wasn't a mistake. And so after spending four years getting a microbiology degree that I didn't need or want, 
like, you know, finally kind of being given this opportunity to find, uh, you know, to work on this degree that I really wanted. Like, I just attacked it with like this ferocity, you know, and I worked harder than everybody else because I just felt like, oh, you know what? Like everyone's been encouraged their whole lives. And like now I just feel like I've been finally let out of the gate and I feel like there's a lot of catching up to do. And so by the time I finished from art school, I just realized like there was something about going to a four year college before that and just building this discipline into uh, just having a work ethic with artists and like just being able to get the deadlines and everything. My first job out of the company, you know, the, out of the art school, like I worked, I worked in the video game industry and things moved really quickly. A year later, I got my first two book deal. A year after that, the book was published. A year after that, I got option for a cartoon show, got the cartoon show, aired for three seasons. And then I just burned out because I never quit the game company or the, or the, or the, uh, the TV show or the books, and then I eventually, like I left the company, left the animation show after the first season, and then I just focused on books. And then there was even a point where uh, Google came out and they, they had uh, made an offer for me to be their creative director for the doodle department. And I had to really kind of sit and reflect and think like, is this what I want? Like, should I be a good parent and provide for the family? Or is it more important for me to pursue like my interest to see how well I can be as a writer and it was just like it was like one of the biggest decisions in my life and I said no I'm going to I'm just going to be a writer and an illustrator and I've never looked back since and it, it's also like are you a corporate person or are you an individual obviously you're not a corporate person in the sense of working in a corporate environment too probably original I have a big problem with having like a lot of eyes on a project because I, I tend to see that the things get homogenized like they're trying to feed everything into a middle trying to get the right yeah right trying to get the widest a part of you know appeal and, and things like that and you know like I, I've, I've learned to embrace like the little flaws and the little mistakes and things it's the things that really give it a lot of character whereas like you work for a corporation there's a lot of polish and just like and you know there's this there's this forced feeling of, you know what, we can, we can manufacture a hit, and that's not, that's not the case. And it just, it, it's irritating to have to work in that kind of it environment. It kind of waters everything down in a way. Yeah. And so you, but, and, and your background, I mean, when did you do your first children's book? This is my first children's this book. This is your first yeah. children's book right out of the gate? Oh my goodness, that's fabulous. Actually, let's look at some of it. Sure. Um, show your favorite spreads. You show yours and then you show yours and see if they're the same. So, so the original, I mean, the working title at the time was No More Poems. No, my poems. Oh, my poems. And I drew this, I drew like this really surreal image of a, of a guy in his little workspace on top of a cloud. And I actually... I actually wanted, I was actually thinking it could be the cover, like I wanted it to be the cover and then they wanted, they wanted it to be more uh, fun and inviting in the, in the respect that like, you know, kids will know that they're silly poems and this wasn't indicative of that nature so I totally understood but this is easily like one of my favorite spreads. Fabulous. Actually I want you to find, read like the first stanza of your favorite poem. Is that a bad thing to say? No. <laughs> Do you, is it like asking you what your favorite yeah. child is? <laughs> yeah. But um, we, but we, but I'm with Dan. We all have um, particular spreads or particular right, right. images that we like best. Um, golly. <laughs> well, why don't why don't I why don't I why don't I read this this poem that Dan uh, drew attention to with my poems? This was one of the first poems I wrote, and uh, it's pretty quick. So maybe if you don't mind, I'll just read the whole thing. The problem with the first stanza is that uh, it it's yeah. Um, my poems, which by the way is misspelled P-O-M-E-S, that's important to note. My poems. I am a man who is paid to write poems. Artists like me don't need regular homes. We live in the clouds with our head full of words, not down in the dirt with all of you nerds. My poems are the gift I give to mankind. My poems are the purpose for which I'm designed. My poems are so brilliant, they light up the earth. So what do you think poems that awesome are worth? I'd say for starters, a million or two, maybe a trillion before I'm all through. I should be richer than rock stars and kings. The fact that I'm not, well, frankly, it stings. You know what? Forget it. It stinks being poor. I'm not going to write y'all no poems anymore. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's darling. That's just wonderful. Well, you all must be so excited. This is, looks like it's a 48-page book. Is it? I, I don't recall what the page... We had more poems that didn't even make it into the book. 
it, I mean, it, look, it looks so meaty. I mean, there's so much going on in it, but it looks very accessible. I guess that's the thing, to make poems accessible to children. Because, you know, people have a phobia. Some people with poetry yeah. is this... You know, it's funny. I did not learn this until way after the fact, till last night. Good thing. Uh, apparently, poems uh, and poems, neither of them are considered s sellable in the children's book world. Nobody wants poems. Uh, but guess what? I made a lot of them, and I think they're pretty good. And so far, people like them, especially weirdly kids. And that's the whole idea. Um, it's really sweet, actually, to see the response that kids have. And some of them really challenge the kids. There's a lot of unreliable narrators in these poems. There's a lot of even unlikable narrators in these poems. And I think it's important that you give kids the sort of the agency and the self-determination to look at the poems, read through them, gather the evidence, figure out for themselves what's really going on, you know, behind the sort of... Uh, the upfront meaning of the poem. Um, and I really love, I think, I mean, obviously I got so lucky getting paired up with Dan to do the art, um, not just because of how um, gifted he is or how much people love him, but also because I think that what he brought to the poems, I mean, he was able to, in, in some cases, the poems maybe are a little dark and he, he would soften them or he would like sort of bring an angle to the poems that would really let the kids in on um, you know, maybe what was really happening. And if they had a hard time, a lot of kids have a hard time, I've found, um, with um, hidden meaning or subtext. And so much of the art really <clears throat> uh, lets the kids have a way into that. One thing I really love is this, um, the art he did for My Device, which is um, a poem that sort of details the, the, the sort of s the loneliness created by our obsession with our handheld devices. And, and this is like this really heartbreaking image of these two little kids, you know, back to back and, and it just how dark you made this world. It's really beautiful in a way. And I think it's still funny and I think kids will, they'll see it and they'll relate to it. But I think it'll, I think it'll push a button, uh, certainly with parents, but I think even with kids, they'll see it and it'll spark something inside them to want them to just, to go to these kids in the picture and say, turn around, you know, look at each other and have fun and go play with each other. And I think it's really sweet. You're so well, great. Julie and I uh, actually love that one because we also think it's like all ages. <laughs> yeah. But um, I wanted to re respond to something you said a few minutes ago about um, that there is this prejudice in publishing that people don't like poetry. But one reason children may like it is it's like a game with words. I do books with gamification, and when you take content and you wrap it around with a game idea, sometimes it, it is the key that turns kids on. If you said those some of those same things without poems, eh, right? Yeah. Well, that's one thing we've learned in our meetings with kids in schools and bookstores is that when you say to them, there's something happening in this poem and it's not really clear up front, you have to figure it out. And after we are finished reading the poem or whatever, raise your hand and tell us what you think it is. And it's so sweet. Even the ones that get it wrong, I mean, you know, wrong, their ideas about what it is are so usually so funny and clever and I really love it. I mean, I know I grew up loving... Um, what was it, uh, Mr. R what was, there was uh, some mystery novels, um, Raskin, uh, anyway, do you remember that, that book? There was, uh, the author, was it, or was it the protagonist? But there were there were a lot of novels. There was one where if you figured out the the solution to the mystery, you could like send it in and you would win a million dollars or something. Okay, I know, I know what you're talking about. I don't, I don't recall. I don't recall the name. It's yeah. it's John so, um, well, speaking of that, so um, did you have any great influences in the art world when you were coming up? Oh gosh, um, books or any art kind of. So it, it's it's interesting. So you know, like uh, in my in my path towards becoming a, an artist, going into art school, a lot of my influences just came from comic books that I read. And then you get to art school, and you know, a lot of the teachers are trying to shake that out of you. They're like, you know, your voice is in there, and you're trying to draw like Jim Lee or or, or Todd McFarlane. And um, you know, I think you I think you kind of hold on to those things because you realize like, well, it worked for them. Maybe it will work for me. And I remember. <laughs> I remember getting a mentorship with David Shannon. Like he started the children's book program at the Art Center College of Design, and then he had left because he had just won the Caldecott Honor Medal for No David. And my teacher at the time, she said, "You should go meet David Shannon because I, I bet he had some great feedback on your work." And so I called David up. 
he invited me over to his place and then uh, I, I, this was like, I think it was halfway through, uh, it was like halfway through my education. I was like, I had already spent like about a year and a half there, it was a two and a half year program. And I showed my portfolio to him and David Shannon looks at it and he says, you need to start over. Like you need to start from scratch. <laughs> and I, I was like, well, what, do you, what do you mean? And he looks at me and he says, look, I can see that you are trying to draw like me, you're trying to paint like me, and that's perfectly fine. I mean, it looks good, but if they want to hire David Shannon, they can call and hire David Shannon. You need to find your own voice. You need to find your own style. And so that really made me think uh, long and hard about it. And I remember going back to my place and like, again, I kind of got into this rut of like trying to grab other styles and maybe like formulate some different style. And it just wasn't working out because I, I found that the biggest frustration was the harder you try to find a style, the harder it is to achieve it because it's like chasing your own shadow. And um, actually the most influential thing I did, I took an advertising class and it was less about the style and substance of what you create because the my advertising teacher at, at the time he said look don't don't market yourself as a style be someone who solves problems if you get a project like solve that problem and communicate it as effectively as possible and so he really had me rely on the symbology of things so for example if i'm going to talk about like oh a good idea like you would draw a light bulb because that is a iconic symbol for an idea and I was just really beholden to that philosophy. And when I first started out in children's publishing, at first I was like the funny picture book guy. A lot of people were sending me funny picture books because I could really just flex that muscle of like adding extra jokes and things like that. But it wasn't until I wrote Beekle that people said, oh, you know, this guy can do like really deep emotional books. But you just have to show people that you can do it. You have to kind of approach projects in a different way, not because you're known for someone who can draw dragons or, or whatever, but because you're a problem solver. And I think a big part of the reason why I'm able to be so prolific and to work on so many different projects is because no one's expect me to draw something one particular way. They expect me to pr solve the problem as best as possible. And also to go back to your comment about advertising, and symbolic using symbols or icons right. it reduces things to their essence that's that's absolutely true and i think i think when you look at some of the best illustrators out there like tom lichtenheld he has a background in advertising like he gets it he knows how to communicate very effectively and very well i mean you see a lot of people that do really beautiful drawings but um you know the the imagery in the book is just as effective it really locks in what's being said in the text you know it's funny one of the poems that I think what's probably the hardest for you to come up with an illustration for is the one that's the least kid-centric in, in our book. And it's, uh, it's called uh, Stinky Mouth You. And it all takes place in a rock tour van. Wow. Yeah. And, and it's a, um, basically it's a how to get your own bench in the back of the tour van uh, by having really bad breath. And what Dan wound up doing was he made the whole thing happen in the rear view mirror so that you can... It's such a great thing. So you can see all the eyes, which is the most expressive part of any, you know, of anybody. And then it kind of gives you the hierarchy. It gives you the guy in the back with his bad breath and his fumes coming off of him. And you see some guitar necks and you kind of see the angry eyes up front. I just love that. I thought the, the problem solving that went into figuring out that was so cool. That must have felt kind of good when you figured oh, that out, right? I'm proud of myself, yeah. I mean, I was going to put the title of the book on the air freshener, but like it came... <laughs> Yeah, it kind of came right down the middle, and it would have been weird to like have it being bisected by the poem on both sides. So great. So now, um, what do you have in the hopper? Uh, I'm working on a longer form children's book. Uh, I'm making a new record with my band, Old 97s. Um, I'm recording uh, episodes of this podcast that I've still got to interview you, Dan, for. Okay. And um, it's called Wheels Off. I just dropped one of those today. Uh, I, a lot. It feels like a lot. And then I'm continuing my dream of finishing a manuscript of a novel that I'm sure is going to be terrible. The first manuscript of the first novel, I'm letting myself know it's all right. I'm giving myself permission. Because then the second draft will be better. And then, the, yeah, it'll get better and better. But I got to get through the first one. But that's my lifelong dream is a long form fiction 
No. Cool. And what about you? I know you are such a busy guy. You must have all kinds of stuff going on. I, I told myself I was going to slow down, but this oh. year I'm illustrating, uh, I'm illustrating four picture book manuscripts from four great authors. Um, and I can't even talk about any of them yet. And then on my own plate, uh, I'm, I'm writing and illustrating two graphic novels. One of them uh, is with Scholastic that I sold like seven, eight years ago. And what happened was that after Beagle, like so many things just kind of landed on my lap that I d it hasn't been until recently that I've been able to come up for some air. And I realized that eight years have passed and I said, I need to, I need to finish this graphic novel because re I really like it. And it, you know, it just, it needs to be done. And then the second graphic novel that I'm working on uh, is a memoir about uh, this three week vacation uh, study abroad thing that I did in Europe. And uh, I met I met a girl and fell in love for the first time. Is that Leah? No. It's not, not Leah. It's not, it's not Leah. It's not my wife Leah. But but she knows about it and she thinks she thinks it's a very charming story. Oh, I, I kind of know her a little bit through Facebook, <laughs> and I am sure that she <laughs> takes it with a grain of salt. Yeah, no, <laughs> She's yeah, like whatever. No. She's been wonderful about it. She's been wonderful about it. Yeah. Very cool. Well, um, so real quick, I'm going to think about um, if you could meet one illustrator or writer in on earth extant or not in your you know who would it be and why oh my gosh i know right um yeah, it's funny maybe it's because i mentioned him earlier and i did actually briefly meet him in an autograph line was kurt vonnegut i just felt like there was something so um, kind about him and thoughtful and I think he communicated uh, the sort of the chaos in his head I think he was so um, easy with getting that out and putting it into words and I just really love and I felt like everything he did made the world a better place so I would have loved to spend more than the 90 seconds I got with him at the autograph table when I was seven you did meet him I did meet Kurt Vonnegut and I, I asked him a really challenging question um, how much money do you make, which is what fourth grade boys right, ask you? That. that comes up a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, I, um, he has a symbol that he, that he did in Breakfast of Champions. Uh, under his autograph, there's the, um, it's an ast asterisk that he uses, and it's kind of a, an inappropriate symbol. And I said, uh, that symbol that you use, and he does it under his autograph. I said, did you know that that's also the Assyrian cuneiform symbol for God? And he goes, well, yes, I guess I'm going to be headed to the bad place when I die. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 I'm sure you're not. But that was my one moment with him, and, and I thought I'd hurt his feelings, but obviously he was fine. Um, and what about you, now that you've had a moment to think it over? Oh, gosh. I mean, you know, so when I was a kid, I met Stan Lee when I was, when I was 12 years old. And I remember my friend and I, we were waiting in line for him for like an hour. And this was like one of these rare West Coast appearances that he was doing. And I remember going up to him and giving him my comic book. And it was like this X-Men number six that I had saved up for months. And Stan, when he signs his name, like Lee, and then he underlines it. So he goes up, takes the comic, and then he, he signs it Stanley, and then he underlines it. But then the pen ripped my number six, like right in half. And you could hear the entire comic hall. Everyone was just like, oh. And Stan looked at it, and he was just like, I'm so sorry I did that. And then he signed it again, and he was like, sorry, I ripped your comic, Stan. And then like the entire convention hall was like, yeah. And so years later, I'm at the San Diego Comic Con and I am at a rooftop party for Disney Channel and Stan Lee walks in with the cast of Heroes when they had their first season. And I see Stan and you know everyone wants to talk to him and he comes up to me and he looks at me and he says, you look like a comic making type. You know, and I'm like, yeah, like I had this story. I told him the story and then I told him about, I told him about how I was conflicted and I didn't want to work in video games anymore and I, necessarily, I wasn't necessarily like, having a great time working at Disney, even though I was at this rooftop party at Comic-Con. And I said to him, I was just like, you know, I'm, I'm contemplating just like working on books and, uh, you know, because I think that's where I'm happiest. And he gave me like some of the best advice. He said to me, he said, do what you love and the money will find you. And the great part of that was that we had like a half hour conversation and everybody on that rooftop party wanted to talk to him, but he would just tell everybody like, okay, well, when I'm done with this young man, and it was like, it was like I was a nobody in that rooftop party, and he took the time and effort to just spend with me and just really encourage me to do what I loved. 
And you know, like there would be nothing I would love more than just to sit and see him again and just like talk to him, just pick his brain, just like tell him thank you, you know. Because he passed away recently. Because he just passed away recently. And for me, like it really, it really touched me. You know, he really touched my heart. And it's just like those small little gestures that really make a huge difference in a person's life. Yeah, we were talking about that with another author, how the first authenticity, and that wasn't your first, of course, uh, but you're th from, a, from an authority figure, if they say you can't draw or, you know, you're no good, I mean, it's really devastating. Oh, yeah. And when you get the opposite, um, you probably had a, a librarian or a teacher that just was special. Mm -hmm. uh, my eighth grade English teacher, Jay What's Jennings. What's the name? Jay Jennings. It's Shout Mark's. out to Jay. Yeah, you know what's funny is years later I was doing um, a day of press for an album the old 97s put out and I saw uh, New York Magazine 145 Jay Jennings. And I thought, no way that's the same Jay Jennings that was my 8th grade English teacher. Sure enough it was, we reconnected as adults and we're friends to this day. He just had a, he just got married and had a kid. and. and How cool! I, I love him, and, and but he went so far and it wasn't... And I think, and it's and it's not always um, encouragement. So I remember on one of my stories that I wrote, it was this really over-the-top story about a woman. Named, I remember her name was White Rose, and her middle name was Petal. I mean, there was something like something kept piling on this stuff, and it was so over the top. And at the bottom of it, he wrote Maudlin. And I remember at the time I was like, crushed, but then I started thinking, like, oh yeah, that was definitely Maudlin. But he was he was kind about it, and then so I thought that was really sweet. It was like your it was like the guy that told you you have to start over from scratch. I love that. I mean, honesty is way better than empty encouragement. Yeah. And had, do you ever have a, a teacher other than your dad saying don't be an artist? Kind of. Um, did you ever have a teacher that early on really affected sure, you? Sure. Uh, when I was in third grade, there was this great librarian, Mrs. Whitley. I don't, I don't recall. Shout out to name. Mrs. Whitley. Shout out to Mrs. Whitley. Um, when I was in third grade, she was running our public. She was running our school library, and she, she knew that my parents didn't want me to take art classes. So she came up to me and she said, well, "Mr. Santat, I know your parents won't let you take art classes, but that doesn't mean you can't check out books to teach yourself how to draw." And she gave me this book, How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way, and I checked that out like for weeks on end and like she would have to pull it away from me and be like you know you have to let other kids check out the book kids would check out the book and they would just immediately go right back to me and i i went like from third grade to sixth grade it was like my bible i checked it out and i did all the i did all the little instructional lessons inside there and then by the time it was done like by the time i was done with grammar school as a gift she gave me the copy and i still have it to this day and my son who is now interested in art I have bequeathed the book to him. So. And was she a school librarian or a public librarian? She was a school librarian, yeah. And I was actually good friends with her daughter, Marcy Whitley. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't spoken to Mrs. Whitley recently, but it would be lovely to get back in oh, touch. Oh, she, she must be so proud of you. So I remember, so after winning the Caldecott Medal, I went to a, a local bookstore in my hometown, and my, uh, my ninth grade English teacher, my ninth, ninth grade on, honors English teacher came up and you know, I saw this woman, it's been a long time, and she looked at me, she's like, do you remember me? And it was one of those moments where you just stare at someone for 10 seconds, and then suddenly, like, everything just gets shoved in your head. You're like, ah, Mrs. Valdez! Yeah, it was amazing, yeah. That's so, so cool, um, and this should be very stimulating for both young children and teachers who are, like, affecting young children. Um, so tell me, we'll do a quick digression. Um, you're in Austin. I'm sure you have been here a lot, being a musician. How do you feel about, no? Uh, I was born in Austin. I am a seventh generation Texan. Uh, my sister lives here and, and brother-in-law and their kids. And I come through town probably four times a year and have since I was a baby. I grew up in Dallas, but I love Austin. Um, and no offense to Dallas, but if I was to move back, it would probably be Austin. This is a great town. But you don't have a Southern uh, Texas accent. I know. I went to a private school and I just, uh, I worked on it. Well, I, don't, I, I might have had it, and sometimes if I stay out with my bandmates for too long, I start to get it back just a little bit, but, yeah, I, I, um, I was too much of an Anglophile, and I would listen to the Beatles and David Bowie and then all these, these uh, Scottish bands that I really loved, and eventually, I'm just, I'm lucky that I don't have a fake English accent at this point. <laughs> Well, I know our fearless leader, Julie Gribble, studies uh, in England sometimes uh, children's books. Alice. She's an Anglophile, if you ever met one. <laughs> um, and you, of course, do not have an accent because no California, other than this Valley Girl take-off <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, so 
What's the question again? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> good question. Oh, I know. We were. Let's segue Texas. back to uh, Austin. Yes. I know you've been here before. I have. I've, I've been here quite a bit recently. Like I went to, it was the Texas Book Festival, then it was TLA, then it was the Texas Book Festival again, and now this TLA. Like I've been here, oh, probably five five times in the last year and a half, two years, and then I know I'm coming back again for some other event in May. But I love, I love, I love visiting here. We just, I just went to the Museum of Weird, and uh, it was like this tiny little place that I went to with Julie Falacco. And I remember, we, so we paid, we did, we did this yesterday. We paid our, <laughs> we paid our twelve bucks, and we go in, and the first thing they show us is like, see this door? This is, this is the apartment that Johnny Depp stayed at when he was filming What's Eating Gilbert Grape. And we looked at each other, and we're like, this is weird. Like, <laughs> okay, you know. And then they had a statue of a pirate, and I'm like, okay, I get that he was Jack Sparrow, but we're talking about when he stayed here when he filmed What's Eating Gilbert Grape. This is the best 12 bucks I've ever spent in my life. Uh. Did it get better? <laughs> not really, not really. That was the peak of his experience. That really was the peak. It's just like, Johnny Stepp stayed here. Wow. Well, so um, you guys are having a great trip here, and you've just, of course, been the best interview we've ever had. <laughs> so I want you to uh, say goodbye to TLA, Bye, and uh, thank, thank you all, and um, have a good rest of the trip.